Choir. Last week we started a new series on the person of Joseph, the great grandson of Abraham, that well known story of Joseph and his brothers, when God's working, how God is working all things for his good, which is the title of our sermon series, For His Good. Joseph has been given a dream, a vision for what the world will be, or what the world can be, and, and according to Joseph's dreams, everyone, including his brothers, his mother, and his father, are going to come down and bow before him. But Joseph's dream is not a dream he's made for himself, it is one he has been given, and that was the challenge last week, hold on to the dreams that God gives to us, the vision that he has for us. But... Just because God gave Joseph a vision doesn't mean everything is going to be easy. Quite the opposite. The vision that Joseph has causes him nothing but pain, nothing but sorrow along the way. But Joseph, like us, has to trust that even when it seems like his dreams are broken, God is working all things for his good. We open our Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis, chapter 37, reading verses 19 to 28. You are now the reading of God's holy word. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, palm, and myrrh. And they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him after all. He is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites and took him to Egypt. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray this morning that you would open our hearts to your word. You would remind us that even when our plans fall through, Hold on to the vision you have given us. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we shared with the kids this morning here, that today is Reformation Sunday, something we celebrate as the church. It's also uh, in that season of Halloween, and I know that this might be hard for some people to wrap their minds around, but uh, Halloween actually has some religious roots in it. It was adapted from the Celtic pagan cultures who believed that on November 1st was the Day of the Dead. You've heard that phrase before, I'm sure. And the Day of the Dead is when the old dead spirits would come back to Earth and hunt people. And so they would dress up in masks and as spirits so that they would steer away the spirits that invaded the Earth on November 1st. And so Halloween is rooted in that, but the church, as it's done throughout time and throughout history, has taken these pagan rituals and pagan holidays, and they change them and make them religious. And so that, as the church moves its way into England and into Ireland, that Celtic tradition, they decide that the best way to share with them Jesus is to take their rituals. It's called what we call contextualization. You take something that a culture uses and you flip it, to give it religious meaning, and so that's what they did. It's called Halloween because it's actually All Hallows' Eve on the day before All Saints' Day, which 
is November 1st. So the church took this Day of the Dead and changed it and made it All Saints Day. And then the church took Halloween as a festival to celebrate those who would come on All Saints Day to pray and to give thanks for the saints that have gone before us. So they took it and flipped it, right? But it's another thing for us as Protestants and as Presbyterians in this Protestant movement that we celebrate it, and that is on October 31st, 1517, here you go, here's your lesson, Missy, 1517, a guy by the name of Martin Luther decides he's going to make his protest against the Catholic Church. It's not a coincidence that he chooses October 31st. Martin Luther decides to nail his thesis to the door of the church, the castle church at Wittenberg on this day because he knows that all the faithful will come to church on All Saints Day. The church of Witt, Catholic Church of Wittenberg had all of these relics, and relics in the Catholic Church were believed to draw you closer to God. The, the Catholic Church of Wittenberg had 5,000 relics that they would bring out on All Saints Day. Luther knew this is where the faithful were going to come. And so, what better way to get his message out to the masses? Now, I know we live in a social media world, and so I thought that I would share some, I, what I think are memes that tell this story pretty well. The first one is, be careful what you post on social media, because we have Martin Luther here, the first one to make the actual post. He got his message out there, and you know, things escalated rather quickly after that for Luther. The next one is, I don't always nail things to doors, but when I do, stuff happens. <laughs> things change. On uh, the next one, this is my favorite, Protestant Reformation, I'd say he nailed it. <laughs> nailed it to the door. Right? What we have is this Luther who decides that God has given him a vision, a dream. Something has to change. The Catholic Church, at this point in time in history, is doing something that's called selling indulgences. We're going to break the Reformation down into just two kind of takeaway things. It's, going to be, it's a long history lesson, and I just don't have time to go through all of it. But here's, here's the two things you need to know. The Catholic Church is selling indulgences. And so what that means is people would sin, and then the wealthy could just pay off their sin and be cleared of it. Because the Pope is trying to build a new castle for himself in Rome. And so their way of raising money is to sell sin, essentially. And so while they could just pay off their sin, and Luther is seeing this as a social justice issue. It's not fair. He doesn't say that indulgences aren't necessary. He says that repentance from the heart is what sets you free. So this idea that you could sell off your sin, just it, to him, was totally abhorrent. That was issue number one. Issue number two is through his study, he came to believe that salvation was by grace alone. Now, these aren't radical thoughts. And quite frankly, the Catholic Church today would agree with these thoughts. But back then, Luther was confronting what he believed to be corruption in the church. Here's the interesting thing about Luther. He actually didn't set out to start a new movement. He didn't set out to start a new church. His desire, his vision, and he talks about this in his writing, his dream was to see the Catholic Church renewed and restored to faithfulness. He believed that they had erred, and that they needed to be reminded by the Scriptures, Sola Scriptura, that idea that we still hold on to today, that the Scriptures provide for us a faithful witness to what we should believe and to do. So that's the brief history of the Reformation. But Luther really believed that he could restore and renew the church. Shortly after Luther posts these things on the door, the Pope gets a little upset that somebody would challenge him, and he decides that Luther is going to be excommunicated, that he's going to be outside the church. And then there's a hint on his life, so Luther goes into hiding. He spends 10 years hiding, and the Catholic Church, this is not a great time, by the way, because the Protestants in this time period, they're not... They're not uh, free of all these sins either. They go around trying to stamp one another out by power and authority throughout Europe. It gets a little ugly. It's not pretty. 
It's not a great moment in church history. And so you got to think that Luther is actually sitting in hiding, worried for his life. And I know this seems a little goofy, but i got to think that this is what he's, he's thinking in his mind, at least. There it is. Well, that escalated quickly. Things got out of hand pretty fast for Luther. The world around him, what he set out to do, he thought would be easy. He thought it would be logical. He thought, this is what God has called me to do. And in reality, the world around him seemed to be crumbling. But Luther has a vision that the church can be faithful. Ironically, he didn't name it as the Protestant movement. The Catholic Church did. Protestant means to protest. We still do that, by the way. The protesters of the church. That was not what Luther had envisioned, and it wasn't what he believed the, was the dream or the vision that God had given to him. It also was not an easy road to walk. You know, Joseph is given a dream, he's given a vision as well. And in similar fashions, he wants just to be faithful. He's not asking to flip the world upside down. He's not asking to be sold by his brothers. He just had a dream. He had a vision. Something that God had given to him. His father sends him out in the fields to check on his brothers. You know, they were sheep herders. And his brothers are out with the flocks out in the fields. And this is not, you know, they don't have farms the way that we do today. They, the, the, the goal of the herder was just to keep the flock together and watch them and lead them to places where they could eat and where they could go. And so his brothers are way far off. He would go out for weeks or months at a time moving the flock and the herds. And so Jacob says to Joseph, go check on your brothers and make sure everything's okay. His brothers see him off in a distance begin a plot to kill him. We read in the book of Genesis this morning, he actually says that uh, the brother actually said, here comes that dreamer. Here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him. Seems a bit over the top. I mean, Joseph hasn't done anything that's you know, particularly that egregious. But then we see the motivations of Joseph's brothers. Motivations like this. And then we'll see what comes of his dreams. You can call it jealousy, you can call it rage, you can call it anger, call it, call it whatever you want. We see the root of their motivation. Then we will see what comes of his dreams. We have this idea. I don't know where we get it from because it's not biblical. That when God gives us a vision or a calling or a dream, that it's just supposed to be this easy road to greatness or to the top. And I don't know where that comes from because there's not one story in the Bible like that. Not one. Life with God and the call of God is generally never easy. That's never the problem. When God gives Joseph this dream or this vision, he doesn't say to him, you know, just sit back, someday this will happen, it will be easy sailing. Actually, the promise or the vision that Joseph has is one that's going to lead him on a road of pain and suffering. The promise of God is never the easy road. And to do great things in the kingdom of God never happens by taking the road most traveled. Now, often we run into brothers with the dreams and visions that God gives us. The people who are dead set on being dream killers. That's what the brothers are, right? They're dream killers. <laughs> Then we will see what comes of his dreams. And the visions and dreams that God gives to us, we will inevitably run into brothers. We will inevitably run into brick walls, into people who think that their goal or their calling in life is to tear them 
down. We live in this culture where we build people up very quickly, and we are also just as quick to bury them as soon as we find the flaw. We're very quick to be critical and say, that will never be, or that can't be, because in our narcissistic and self-centered world, we got to be on top, and the only way to be on top is to take others down. It is the world in which we live. And we like to think that that's just the world out there, but notice who are the ones who are the dream killers in Joseph's story. It's his own flesh and blood. It's often the ones who are closest to us, who want to destroy the vision that God has given us. The call of God and the life of God was never meant to be easy. If you don't believe me, let's take a look at some of these old loved hymns that we have and pay attention to the words. The first one, my hope is built on nothing less than Christ, the solid rock I stand, right? When darkness seems to hide his face, rests on his changing grace. How about the next one? Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. It's such a beautiful hymn. Though darkness hide me, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. And maybe from our friend Martin Luther, a mighty fortress, is our God. Though the earth with devils filled should threaten to undo us. This is the story. As the bride of Christ, as his church, though the earth with devils filled should threaten to undo us. Darkness is part of the story. Imagine, put yourselves just for a moment in Joseph's shoes. You're going, doing exactly what your father told you to do being faithful. And you get there, and your own flesh and blood jumps you, steals your coat, throws you in a cistern. Thanks to Reuben, the brother, who doesn't actually stand up to his brother, just tries to work behind the scenes. At least he doesn't get killed. But you see, that's when you begin to see God working all things, all the players for his purpose. So the brothers decide, well, we don't necessarily want his blood on our hands, and we gain nothing from that. So here comes these tradesmen. Let's just sell them. They sell them for 20 shekels of silver, which is about 8 ounces. And in modern-day standards, that means about 5 bucks. So you're Joseph. Your brothers think you're worth $5, but you've been given a dream, a vision. What a punch in the God there. Your brothers value your life. Five bucks. Can you imagine being Joseph in that caravan? Watching your brothers disappear into the skyline like specks in the distance. Having been sold for almost nothing. I got a thing that Joseph is wondering how that escalates so fast. How that get out of hand so quickly? I got to wonder the pain and the hurt in Joseph's heart that his own flesh and blood sold. no way Joseph is sitting on that caravan thinking, well, this is how I thought my life was going to play out. This was the plan I had, <laughs> right? You see, God didn't give Joseph a plan. God gave Joseph a dream. According to James, it's foolishness for us to plan. Because God does not give us a plan. He gives us a vision, a dream. The plan belongs to God.
So Joseph has two options. He can give in to the anger and hatred and frustration of that moment, or he can trust the one who has given them this vision to see it through to the end. What do we do when our plans fall apart? What do we do when the dreams that we have seem to be killed by others? James says that you are but a mere mist. You don't know what tomorrow will bring, for you are a mere mist who's here now and vanishes in an instant. That isn't to say that you don't have purpose or meaning in your life. It is to challenge you to have a perspective. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we do know the one who holds tomorrow. Proverbs reminds us that it's foolishness for us to boast in our plans because it's God that determines our steps. This was not the plan that Joseph had for his life, I'm sure. But God is going to pick up the broken pieces and weave together a beautiful image of restoration and redemption. I love being a parent. It is also the most frustrating thing in the world at the same time, when you hold these two things together, right? A few years ago, when I started, a few years, 10 years ago, when I started here as a pastor, I moved into the house, and Lauren and I got married, and I had a motto. That motto was, everything has a place and a purpose. It's a great motto. Then we had four kids in four and a half years, and now my motto is, embrace the chaos. I would say that at least 50% of our time with our kids is Laura or I cleaning up things that they have thrown everywhere. At least 50%. They go take a nap, we clean up, they come downstairs, it's like we never cleaned up. That just happens at least 10 times a day. It's a, you know, there are some days where I'm just like, forget it, I just want to sit here and see what happens. It gets worse. It doesn't get better on its own. That's just life as it is. You know, I had a dream when I was younger that everything would have a place and a purpose. That is no longer my life. I can't help but think that this is how God sees our lives play out on a daily basis. That we come and make a mess of everything and we have this Father in heaven just constantly puts the pieces back together. That he takes our broken dreams and our broken marriages and our broken relationships and our broken lives and all the things in our life that we look at and go, that wasn't the plan. That's not how it was supposed to be. And God is up there cleaning it all up, using all things in our lives for his glory and for his goodness. know how the story of Joseph would play out. So the question for the church becomes, do we trust the one who's putting it all back together when it seems like our dreams have been destroyed? God will use this in Joseph's life for his good work in the world. And if we let him, and if we live remain faithful, God will use ours as well. Hold on to the dream that God has given you. To the vision that he's given us. I promise you, you will see God use all things for his good. It's Joseph's plan that gets broken. Not his vision. May it be with us that God uses us for his good work in this world, for his glory, for his good.
name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now stand and affirm what we believe by stating the Father. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost.